Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the really short three-game main slate we have here on Thursday. Um, got some time available here today, so we're going to quickly go over um, it's kind of what we might see, maybe a little bit of strategy on some short three-game slates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we've got projections and ownership loaded, of course. For DK, uh, I do have some FanDuel stuff loaded in here, so maybe we might touch on a little bit of that as well. Probably just for you know pitchers, of course. Um, you know, we've we've got these guys over here, but the you know fundamental analysis is always the same. Um, and here's kind of a sneak peek at uh, picture ownership as far as the industry aggregates are concerned so far here today for the uh, the short three gamer. Um, so with just three games, uh, hopefully I'm going to keep it under a freaking hour and a half here. Um, I do want to, uh, you know, quickly mention, um, you know, that we're still working in the background with trying to get, um, you know, FanDuel and and hopefully Yahoo as well, uh, perhaps a, another site um, in the near future too. In addition to those three, up and running for fan or uh, excuse me for baseball. Um, we're doing a lot of work. It's, I, I know it doesn't seem like we have been, and it's been a full season without at least my FanDuel stuff. Um, but we are, we're developing, um, you know, a, as quickly as possible to, uh, to, in order, in order to get those out for you guys. So, um, that's still a work in progress and going into the fall here, uh, we obviously will have, um, you know, NFL and and some of the other fall sports and winter sports uh, up as well. And we hope to have all of the stuff for DraftKings, FanDuel, Yahoo, uh, you know, whole nine yards uh, for everybody. All right. So uh, housekeeping aside, let's just get into the games here. We'll go over these kind of briefly um, and maybe try and pick out a little bit of value. And as I said, talk about perhaps a little bit of you know, short slate DFS theory and strategy uh, in baseball. Uh, first one we have here is Washington and the Mets. We got JoJo Gray and Kadai Sang on the mound. Um, interesting price tags for both of these guys, right? JoJo down here at 6,600. Well, I think this is a bit too cheap here. Um, now he's been, you know, hovering in the what 7K range most of the season, right? Um, and now we're getting him down at 6,600 on a three-game slate. I think this is a, a pretty good opportunity, even though he's not all that impressive and the, and the matchup is not great here against the Mets, right? Um, pretty good opportunity to jump on board and get a little bit of JoJo exposure. Um, you know, this is a pretty precipitous price drop. He, you know, just two starts ago was 8,100. Now we're getting him 1,500 cheaper. Um, is that really a reflection of how difficult the matchup is? I mean, perhaps. Is it really a reflection of uh, how poor his performance is in two of the last three? You know, three of his last, last six have been? Yeah, perhaps. Um, you know, we kind of know the, the deal with JoJo here. He's not striking out a lot of guys this season. Sacrificed a lot of that in order to reduce the power and induce more soft contact with the introduction of the... Um, of the cutter and more of the two seamer as well. And that's really been his MO this season, right? A lot of soft contact here, full 22% in aggregate. That's really strong. One of the higher numbers for a starting pitcher in baseball. Um, when we combine that with hard contact rates under 30%, now we are, now we're really talking, right? With a 6,600 price tag. I know it's on a three game slate. We don't have to be all too sensitive to price necessarily but there are still edges that we can exploit and i think this perhaps is one of them he's got fine breaking stuff right it's about league average slightly better uh, the fastball mix leaving it on the table a little bit certainly with the cutter um as this is a new pitch for him still feeling this out and developing it the four seamer has been far far better this season than it was last year he was giving up power in spades uh, on this pitch alone he's got that down to only giving up about a half an out three quarters of an out to the field that's a, a really really big improvement 
Um, not to say it's a good pitch necessarily, because it's still giving up equity relative to other forcing fastballs. But it's a hell of a lot better than it used to be. Um, sinker is the same sort of deal. Not a lot of good equity in the fastball arsenal here from JoJo. Uh, and the sinker is just generally not a, a very good pitch unless you can keep it way, way down in the strike zone. He does get some ground balls. That's encouraging to the right side, right? The production against righties, he'd give up a little bit of pop. Some average 260 here. Um, that's because he screws around still with a bad fastball. And he'll throw this cutter on occasion to a righty, uh, which is not a very good idea. Doesn't have outsized swing and miss with the slider against the right side, but does still induce ground balls. And that keeps him in play, certainly, with that 23% soft contact rate and sub-30% hard contact rate against a righty. So even though there's a slightly elevated 173 ISO here realized... Uh, for the most part, he's running right in line with kind of where he should be with a 158x ISO here. And if we just raw average these two figures, 142 ISO against lefties and the 173 against righties, uh, we come out right to that, that 158. So um, it's not a you know perfect calculation, of course, since it's not weighted for number of hitters that he's seen, but uh, I digress. That said... Um, for the most part, you know, a 250 XBA, 330 X Woba, 160 X ISO, these are pretty damn good numbers considering how awful they were last year. These were, you know, 5, 6, 8% higher pretty much across the board. I mean, he was giving up 230, 240 ISOs. He had a 300 ISO to left handers last year, for example. So, um, you know, JoJo's made significant improvements this year. He's still spraying it, you know, quite a bit to the left-handers. 14% walk rate. That's concerning, of course. The sub-60% strike one, also a concern. And when we've only got 20% whiffs, this starts to uh, rear its head a little bit. And that's how we can go after JoJo if we choose to do so. Um, however... As I mentioned, with the high soft contact, hard, low hard contact, and the price tag here, I think there's a little bit of value we might be able to squeeze out of JoJo, mostly because of a low ownership figure, right? We got six guys going, and that is, I mean, we could do the math here, um, you know, about 16, 15, 16% ownership, give or take, for uh, each starting pitcher, right? Uh, on average, and we're getting JoJo a little bit under that you know, average figure, and I think that's a, an opportunity to perhaps, uh, certainly in a down matchup, jump on board with a little bit of JoJo. Uh, we can go after the Mets. They have been seeing the baseball a little bit better recently. Uh, of course, they had a huge night against Domingo Herman the other day. Um, got to a little bit of Carlos Rodon yesterday, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been seeing it a little bit better. Um, you know, Pete Alonso hopefully starting to heat up, not hitting for really any average this year, about uh, you know eight ticks lower, eight full percentage points, um, you know, than his career numbers. Power is still there for Petey, of course, and um, you know we know that he can he can hit two out in any given matchup. Same thing with Frankie Lindor. Average is down this season. Um, and he's been struggling a little bit. Power's still there. He's still a pretty good hitter, and I'd say overall, Frankie Lindor still, um, you know, from either side of the plate, their best r pure hitter. Brandon Nimmo, good contact piece up at the top of the lineup. The issue that we're going to run into here with the Mets is they got price bumps today, and I think this is one of the pricing inefficiencies that we can try to exploit they're going to be the most popular team going after jojo here and i'm not sure that's totally warranted like we know the offense is bad right in general just a 105 wrc plus here 21 percent strikeout rate so they're going to make contact they'll walk a little bit of course but just a 170 iso not all that impressive 32 percent hard contact not all that impressive there 320 woba this is average, right? A 240 batting, raw batting average is also roughly league average. They create a little bit, got some guys here because they make so much contact with a Brandon Nimmo, Jeff McNeil type. Frankie will you know, swipe a bag every now and then. Tommy Pham has had a pretty decent season, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they have some pieces, and they can be a little bit dangerous. But given their very likely... Uh, 
super high ownership today going after JoJo. I'm not sure this is totally warranted. Some of the lefties here, uh, are they're going to walk a little bit, so that depresses their relative upside a tiny bit. Uh, they are going to be able to lift the baseball and, and hit it in the air. That's Frankie Lindor territory, right? Jeff McNeil, maybe a little bit. These guys are going to hit ground ball. Same with Brandon Nimmo. Um, you know, about a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy himself against righties. So that's an okay and slightly plus batted ball matchup for the Mets. Uh, it's But their price tag's given Nimmo back up to 4,800 now. Frankie Lindor at 52, Pete Alonso up to 55. You missed the 4,500 train on on Petey there. So he's seen a thousand dollar price bump today um everybody else mostly in the same sort of range but getting to the guys that you really want to play they actually profile the best batted ball wise against jojo and unfortunately they've seen price bumps and they're also going to be popular so that would on a short slate give us a little bit of an opportunity to not only just play jojo on the other side at a reduced price tag reduced ownership etc etc he's got He's got some suppression in him here, even though he does have a 350 ERA with a 480 XFIP and an 83% strand rate. We're looking for those to uh, regress negatively, of course. Um, but this is a three-game slate, and we can basically do whatever the hell we want. And I think attacking cheaper price tags and low ownership on some guys and capitalizing on some variants is a fine and, and uh, a sound approach to take. Um, so, match spiel aside... Kodai Senga, I mean, you guys know the deal with Kodai Senga. I cannot stand the freaking walk rate. Um, now, I know JoJo is also walking 10% of guys here, but JoJo's only doing that to left-handed hitters. He's a little bit better. I mean, he's far, far better in terms of just raw suppression against righties. Gets ground balls, right? It keeps it down in the strike zone. Kodai Senga, he also gets ground balls, keeps it down in the strike zone, but he has a 11 12 percent walk rate to both sides of the plate so he's going to put more guys on base for free and that's what really drives me absolutely crazy he's got the same 59 percent strike one that jojo has and effectively i mean he's got a one tick lower chase rate even though he's got a historically and i guess um you know categorically uh much better swing and miss chase type of pitch in the split here than jojo who doesn't really have a change up at all um 9,000 here for Gadai Senga. I think the price tag is generally fine for him, right? This is where I want him in general on full 10, 12 game slates, right? But now we're on a three game slate. He's see it's 60% ownership. Um, he pretty clearly, I think, has the best suppression matchup, right, against Washington, who is a an unimpressive offense to say the least, right? Hit a lot of ground balls here. They don't have hardly anybody that can hit it in the air with any regularity. They just don't strike out, and they make a lot of hard contact. No power and um, you know, no real hard, outsized, uh, good barrel contact here from Nationals. So it makes them super difficult to play. However, this is a three-game slate. Could I single walks people? So if you want to stack the Nats, yeah, go ahead. You can do whatever the hell you want. They will be certainly well off the board, but Kodai Senga is the most popular guy here at 60%. He probably should be, right, because he still induces a lot of ground balls, as we talked about. Doesn't give up a lot of power, necessarily, and really no batting average, right? So it's going to be difficult for Washington to string together a lot of production because Kodai Senga, for all his warts here and the 12% walk rate, he still has a 30% strikeout rate, and he's not bad, necessarily, it's just that he has problems throwing strikes, and he elevates his pitch count. At 9,000 and 60% ownership, the easiest way in a three-game slate to get different well, is to fade the most popular guy and then stack against him. Um, is that a super equitable line here to take? I mean, yeah, it's a three-game slate. You know, we can really, like I said, embrace a lot of that variance. Um, batted ball-wise, we don't match up very well for Senga, so I'd, I still have to side with him because he induces so many ground balls. But he's attackable a little bit with some right-handers here. Just a buck 15 ground ball to fly ball against the righties. 35% hard contact. He'll give up some more baseballs in the air to the right side with a 178 ISO here. But overall, the expected batted ball metrics are pretty damn good with a 217 XBA, 297 X Woba, and a 124 X ISO. That's to both sides with a 30% strikeout rate. So despite the fact that the Nationals don't strike out a lot and they make good contact, I still kind of have to side with Kodai Senga here 
And, you know, if I'm building a ton of teams, um, you know, maybe you come in roughly with the field. Maybe you come in under or even slightly over if you really like the spot. Um, generally, there's not a hell of a lot of edge to be found in pitcher ownerships on such, such short slates, especially for the guy that's, you know, pretty clearly in the best spot uh, fundamentally and suppression-wise. Um, strikeout-wise, not necessarily. We'll get to some other, you know, spots as we analyze, you know, the other games. But I think you got to side with him, of course. He's certainly got the highest projection, highest value score. But, um, you know, you can take some pieces over here. we got to be careful with uh, Washington's lineup and see what they want to do. C.J. Abrams, he'll almost certainly be at the top. He's up to 3,900 now. Do I really want to be playing that when Senga's not giving up production to, to the left-handers? Probably not. Lane Thomas up to 51. He, outside of Jamer... Um, and maybe Joey Manessis. He's, you know, right up there as the one of the better hitters on the team. He's a good ball player over here, Lane Thomas. Jamer got hit in the kneecap yesterday, so he might not even be in the lineup. He would be my favorite because he hits for the most power against right-handers, um, and he would offer the most raw upside, you know, from a power perspective if you're targeting, you know, balls in the air. Jamer does hit the baseball in the air and, and does hit for a good bit of power against righties. Um, but he may very well just sit because he was in a lot of pain when he got hit yesterday. Joey Manessis, from a, a batting average perspective, he's got the highest numbers there. He's hitting about 280 uh, or so on the season, but he just doesn't hit for any power. Um, can you mix him in? He might be able, he might be starting to find it a little bit. You could mix him in at 3,800. Certainly not my favorite first base play, but he is playable. I, if I had to choose, I'd probably just rather play Dom Smith. He actually does hit the baseball in the air from the left side. But once again, I'm not jacked about playing a lot of lefties, really, or righties necessarily, against Kodai Senga. Um, so if I got to choose somebody, I mean, it's probably just like Lane Thomas, maybe an Alex Call. But he doesn't have all that good of numbers, and he kind of stinks. Um, Dom Smith perhaps. Kbert Ruiz doesn't strike out, but he doesn't have any power either. So this is a really difficult spot to be stacking the Nationals. You're going to need them to really make a lot of contact here, hit for some average, and get on base with a lot of walks. Um, the walks are there, but not necessarily well, you know, will be the average. So um, that's why we got to side with Senga here. I have no problem playing him, but if you want to get different, you know, by all means, go ahead and stack the other side. So favorites here are going to be uh, JoJo with a Jamer if he if he starts. Uh, maybe a Dom Smith as a contrarian first base play. A little bit of Corey Dickerson, still a pretty good hit tool, even though the numbers are down. He just doesn't get a lot of ABs anymore. Still a very good hitter. Uh, C.J. Abrams from the left side, but once again, I'm not super thrilled about stacking a bunch of lefties. From the Mets, of course, it's the usual suspects, Brandon Nimmo, Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonso. Um, Frankie Alvarez is probably going to be able to make a little bit of contact here from behind the plate. Assuming he's in there today, um, you know, Brett Beatty, Mark Conna, you can play these guys in stacks, certainly. But once again, you got to be careful. The offense is is bad and not very good. Um, I got to side with JoJo here and go after the Mets. I think that's the most edge that we're going to find in this game, to be quite honest. All right. Um, long spiel of one game aside. Let's get to game number two. Cubs and the Cardinals here. Justin Steele on the mound. Now, I really love Justin Steele. He needs a third pitch, however. He's 8,600 today, and this is back-to-back -back starts for him against the Cardinals. So you guys normally know how I like to target that. Uh, certainly in back-to-back -back starts, I, I just side with the offense. Um, but it kind of depends. It's not uh, necessarily fully black and white there. But he tore them apart in his last start, literally just, what, six days ago now. Um, six and a third inning, struck out nine, gave up two earned runs, sprayed six hits. It is the, what, fourth time he's seeing them this season, and in two of the three, he's taken them apart pretty well. Six innings, eight strikeouts, one earned run in the start before his last against them, and then early in the season, earlier, and early part of May, also went six innings, but struck out just three, gave up three runs, walked three batters. So two or three starts this year against Cardinals for Steele have been very good. Um, we've seen him recently price-wise up in the 9Ks. We even saw him above 10,000 once this season. As I mentioned, where I get 
uh, a little weary is that he's only got two pitches. Now, the two pitches are very good with cutter slider. Show me change up, show me curveball, show me sinker. So for all intents and purposes, we can just leave those out. Um, and he's going to rely mostly on the cutter here and the slider. Now, the cutter, of course, is not a raw swing and miss pitch. He doesn't have the four-seamer, doesn't really have the two-seamer, and he doesn't have a changeup. So that's why we see a depressed strikeout rate overall to the right-handers, just 22%. It's about a tick below average, and that's kind of a dangerous game that we start playing when we go after the Cardinals with below-average strikeout stuff. Now, against the left side... Um, we talked about this with a couple of guys, notably like a Corbin Burns, Graham Ashcraft type, you know, that mostly rely on a cutter. Well, Steele does the same thing. And when we throw a cutter to same-handed hitters, that's when we get picked apart a little bit. We do have a short 20 and two-thirds, 82-hitter sample here this year. But as we see, a cutter is going to tail over the barrel here, and that's what translates to power. It's a 185 ISO to lefties this year, just an 089 to the right side. The cutter, a very good suppression pitch, soft contact pitch. He's elite with it, and he does induce a lot of rollover type of contact in ground balls. Buck 60 ground ball to fly ball with the cutter slider combo against opposite handed hitters. So if we're going after him, we don't want to be doing it with righties, as a matter of fact. It would be with some lefties. Now, we'll have to see what the Cardinals want to do. They've been dealing with some injuries recently. Did just activate a guy like a Tyler O'Neill. But he's from the right side, Jordan Walker, also uh, with Paul DeYoung, Taylor Motter from the right side, in addition to, you know, of course, Goldschmidt, Arenado, and Wilson Contreras, all from the right side. So we may only get one, possibly two lefties in this lineup here, depending on how they want to structure things. And the lefty is likely to be Lars, and he might be down at the bottom of the lineup. Um, kind of stiff to play a $4,000 price tag in the nine hole or something. Uh, against a pretty good arm over here that still has 26% whiffs in the tank against the left side, you know, despite the fact that he gives up a little bit of pop. Still induces ground balls here. 34%, 35% hard contact or so. We can stomach that when he's inducing ground balls. And the line drive rate is still sub 20%, all the way down at 18 Everything here for Justin Steele, despite just having two pitches, is pretty damn good, right? The swing and miss with the slider is getting him there against lefties. The cutter kind of giving a little bit of that back, however, when he gets onto the barrel with it. But overall, the plate discipline number is very good. 5% walk rate, 65% strike one rate, 31-32% chase, 26% CSW. It's fine. We would love for him to develop a third pitch. Ideally, it's a changeup. Uh, or a curveball that could induce a little bit more swing and miss to opposite-handed hitters. Ideally, it would be a change. Um, does have it, but once again, you know, it's sub-1% ownership, or, or uh, usage, rather. Um, you know, that's not really a qualifying pitch in the quiver, necessarily. So overall, I, I do like Justin Seal. I like a price tag drop for him. Um, we're not getting as steep a uh, discount, I should say, on Steel as we are with, like, a JoJo, for example. So that's, you know, not great. And this is still a difficult matchup because he's not going to throw it past a lot of the right-handers. But I'm okay playing some Justin Steele here and going after the Cardinals. They're going to be number two in ownership on the day. Well, two and three. We'll get to the Cubs in a sec. Um, and they got some really good hitters. The problem with the Cardinals over here is, again, their price tags. Paul Goldschmidt at his normal price tag at 6000 Same thing with Arenado at 5700 Everybody else is cheap, but they're also at their normal price tags. Are we really getting all that much value when Steele from the you know against right-handers has really good numbers? Are we really getting all that much value paying normal price tags for guys like the Cardinals, uh, Wilson Contreras, Tyler O'Neill, Jordan Walker, uh, Paul DeYoung? I mean, do you want to play Taylor Motter? I mean, I don't. Um, so I'm, I think I'd kind of have to side with Justin Steele here, even though it is back-to-back -back starts against a good offense for him. Uh, it's what might take us off here from a weather perspective, right? It's 95 plus degrees in Chicago tonight. Um, you know, if they get any wind there whatsoever, like this would turn into just a, a total launching pad in Wrigley. It doesn't look like we're going to have any wind there, but it is, it, uh, oh, it's actually in, um, I screwed this up. Not sure why I said Wrigley. Um, it's in uh, St. Louis. 
Uh, that said, you know, the, the wind doesn't play nearly as large a factor, but uh, 100 degrees in St. Louis, ballpark plays up offense there similar to how Wrigley does, just not, um, you know, to a certain extent. So uh, scrap everything I said about uh, Wrigley win. Um, nevertheless, 100 degrees, and the baseball flies in 100 degree weather, really, no matter where you're hitting. So um, it could be an opportunity for some of the Cardinals to lift the baseball, like Goldschmidt and Arenado in particular. They do still hit the baseball in the air. And from the right side, you know, that's a good batted ball matchup. You need fly ball hitters against ground ball pitchers. That turns into line drives. Um, so that's reasonable. Uh, however, most of these other guys are going to hit the baseball on the ground. So given outsized kind of uh, ownership on the Cardinals here, I'm not super thrilled uh, about playing them at their particular price tags in what I consider a down matchup. So I think I'm going to have to side a little bit with Steele here, despite the fact that, um, you know, just the two-pitch arsenal, the weather, and the, um, you know, the, the offense, of course, on the other side, um, really kind of taking me off. I think, you know, taking some shorts on, on some of the Cardinals' price tags is okay. Um, he's all seeing them in back-to-back starts, you know, certainly doesn't, you know, make me all that confident. Michaelis is on the mound for the Cards. Uh, 6,800. He's at his normal price tag, so I'd rather just pivot it to JoJo uh, because Michael is seeing more ownership here, um, and I think Michael is, is well worse, uh, to be quite honest. He's got a now the the line drive rates here. What really have been um, you know turning me on to Michael is shorts really all season. It's just way way too high. Now it's ticking down, so good for him. Um, he's been a little bit more serviceable in the suppression department recently but like even what his four starts ago he had a really really good outing against the White Sox went seven struck out six no production um really allowed but he turned that around against Washington went three innings that that game may have been ringed out um poor DFS outing there against Miami went six innings just struck out just three though and gave up three runs so not serviceable in DFS he also got a win out of that and only popped for 13 DK points so like um is a nine percent DFS out or a nine point DFS outing rather uh really all that impressive I don't think so and he also just saw them five days ago six days ago um he went five innings, which is great. Struck out just three, which is not great. Gave up five runs, which is really not great. Sprayed 11 hits in that game. So um, I'd like to go right back to the Cubs. I don't like Michaelis's line drive right here, and I don't like uh, the fact that he's not inducing a lot of ground balls here. If he's inducing a lot of ground balls, you know, at a buck fifty sort of rate or so, and he has a 25% line drive rate, that's a little more palatable. But for the most part, he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy with a high line drive rate. That means baseball's in the air and and on a line uh, for the most part, as opposed to on the ground and on a line, which is you know, really where we would like to be if we've got to be on a line that much. He's not throwing it past people. We'd obviously like to strike out stuff a hell of a lot higher. Um, the only sort of saving grace here for Miles Michael is, well, number one is the price tag, right? He's only, you know, at average ownership as well. But it, it's that he's got five pitches. Um, now, the curveball, not great, right? Two-seamer, not great. He still mains this pitch as a, you know, in his fastball arsenal, which is not good. Throws it to right-handers, which is fine, but he also throws it to lefties, which is not fine. The four-seamer is just break-even. Um, so this is a very attackable arsenal. He doesn't really have one excellent pitch, if you want to consider it the slider, it's still just not a swing and miss pitch. It's a ground ball, weak contact type of pitch for him. Um, and that really still just depresses his upside. He doesn't walk guys, and he stays off of the barrel, so this is all great. 68% six, strike, one or so, that's fine, but just 7% swinging strikes. He pitches to 86% contact. It's too high, even on a three-game slate for my liking. Uh, if you want to play him, sure. Because he's going to allow you to get contrarian, and he's cheap. That's fine. You can do whatever you want on a three-gamer. Because the Cubs over here against right-handed pitching, 23% strikeout rate, no hard contact relative to league average, no power relative to league average, just a 150 ISO, buck 30 ground ball to fly ball. So can you go after the Cubs here in 
and expect a little bit of positive regression for Miles Michaelis compared to his last outing when they really picked him apart? Sure. Uh, I think that's a fine way to approach it. As I mentioned, I generally side with the offense and back-to-back starts for a team against a starting pitcher, um, but not necessarily when the pitcher got blasted the previous outing, right? I think you can play momentum the other direction as well. So Michael is, is certainly in play. Um, for me, I'd probably rather just uh, go play JoJo and and figure out how to get contrarian with my offenses otherwise, no, not that Michaelis isn't contrarian or anything, but you uh, you kind of get the picture. So uh, I'm likely to stay off of him. I really think that you're going to need a probably 20 points here. Does he have that in him? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with the same regularity that I think JoJo can get there, I don't think so. So I think I might just have to side with JoJo. And that means if I'm not playing Michaelis, well, you kind of have to play the Cubs because you know there's only six teams on the slate. Um, and you don't really want to be stacking Washington, right? But how they can get there, they can still string together, um, you know, some base runners, right? They have Nico up at the top who doesn't strike out really at all. Uh, Ian Happ's been a little bit better recently. Mike Talkman against right-handers not striking out this season, about 20, 22% or so. Um, and they walk a little bit, right? Say Suzuki perhaps starting to turn it around. Dansby just came off the DL. He is back. Um, still an okay hitter. Chris Morell obviously has power, right, against a guy that's not going to strike him out. That's a pretty equitable spot there. They're expensive. Cody Bellinger got a $1,000 price bump himself, um, so that's not my favorite necessarily, but Nico's still above fifty or 5000 at 5300 Everybody else, though, pretty cheap. Dansby is 45. Chris Morell down at the bottom of the lineup where he would likely be at 5400 Certainly not my favorite second base play price adjusted, but from a power perspective, um, that that's absolutely in play and certainly in play in stacks if you are playing stacks. Um, so that's kind of how I'd like to approach it. I'd like to get to the Cubs, try and get contrarian with them where I can, and go after some Michaelis. We don't get a ton of leverage on it, which kind of stinks, but uh, I'm okay uh, targeting some Michaelis here. And going after this high line drive rate, I think it's just too high. Um, and I, I do, as I mentioned, you know, even though we kind of got confused here, I like the weather here. Uh, I really like playing hot games uh, weather-wise in St. Louis. It's a generally pretty pitcher-friendly ballpark, for the most part neutral overall. But when it's hot, the baseball can really, really fly. And I think Michaelis is absolutely attackable here. This contact rate at 86% is uh, way, way too high for me, um, even on a three-game slate. So I'm going to go elsewhere. So that said, we'll move on to the last game here. Um, Cleveland and the White Sox, I think... Pretty much everything is in play here, as it is, you know, naturally being on a three-game slate. But from a fundamental perspective, I think everything is in play here, too. Tanner Bybee at 7,200. Price perspective, uh, we're getting him, I mean, he's been in the mid-8Ks most of the season, really. We're getting him back down at 7,200, closer to his sort of debut price tag, um, which is attractive, right? He gets the White Sox who are a pretty poor offense themselves, right? They don't walk. They strike out in an average to slightly above average clip. 83 WRC+, plus, average power, average hard contact, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Ton of ground balls here at a buck 40 per. Now, batted ball-wise, we kind of have to come off here. This is why the White Sox would be in play. Because Tanner Bybee's a little bit of a fly baller with the four-seamer slider change up in strike zone a little bit. Um... That gives him that fly ball lean. Now, his numbers overall are very good, right? 216 XBA, 281 X Woba, and a 123 X ISO. These are fantastic numbers. Um, walk rates at 8.5%. It's very good. And you can get away with a fly ball pitcher when he's got these kinds of suppression batted ball metrics here. 26% hard contact is fantastic. 3 ERA, 430 X FIP pointing a little bit higher, sure. Because he'll give up a little bit of pop on occasion to a right-hander. But for the most part, he's not going to put pay people on base for free. He stays off of the barrel. And he's efficient early in the count with some swing and miss. He can induce with a decent changeup, with a decent slider. That's to both sides of the plate. Has a show-me curveball, which isn't great. But he does have a little bit of swing and miss there as well. Um, I like the velocity deltas here. Certainly a full 11-mile-an-hour velo delta on the changeup to the four-seamer. Four-seamer is already good, and then you throw an 11-mile-an-hour delta on that to the change, or with the change. Um, change-ups can be very good also. 
So he's good to both sides. And in any of the left-handers that the White Sox are going to throw out at him tonight, like uh, Yoan Moncada, who they just got back, um, they do have Oscar Colas in there as well. He strikes out a boatload, however. Um, Andrew Benintendi doesn't strike out at all. But there's a little bit of upside, certainly, for Bybee to induce some swing and miss from anybody swinging from the left side of the plate. Does Monty Grandal, only about 20-22% strikeout rate himself from the left side. But having just an average season, really, at best for Grandal. So, they'll have max, I would say, four lefties in there. Um... Not all that great a spot because he's got a good changeup and can still induce swing and miss a little bit with the uh, left-handed or a slider two left-handers, I should say. If we want to go after some Tanner Bybee, it would be with some sort of ground ball lean right-handers, and good for them. They got a lot of those guys. Tim Anderson, Eloy Jimenez, Andrew Vaughn types, even Jake Berger a little bit um, against right-handed pitching, ground baller for sure. Luis Robert, he's a pure fly ball hitter, so that kind of takes me off of off of that a little bit. Uh, he's at his normal price tag. I think this is kind of a down matchup uh, against Tanner Bybee, and he's going to strike out a lot, right? 26% K rate for Bybee, and um, for Luis Robert, he has a 28.5% strikeout rate against right-handers this season. He's about an 080 ground ball to fly ball guy, and we don't really want to target that necessarily. He's still Luis Robert, and if you know Bybee hangs a curveball or a slider here or just pipes a four-seamer, yeah, sure, Robert's going to hit it over the wall. Uh, But price adjusted, I think I'd probably like to get to some of the ground balling guys. Not so much with Tim Anderson at his normal price tag because he hits about five ground balls per fly ball against righties. I think my favorite would have to be Aloy. He still makes a lot of hard contact. He's at his roughly normal price tag, 4,200 here. Um, and still hits for a little bit of power and a decent bit of average, despite the fact that he can't freaking stay healthy. So he's got to be the favorite. Andrew Vaughn probably right after that, then maybe a Jake Berger. Uh, From the left side, sure, go ahead and mix in an Andrew Benintendi. If you end up stacking the White Sox, I think that's all fine. Uh, No problems playing Yohan Moncada either from the left side. He's far, far better from the left side than he is the right side, even though this is a down spot for lefties in general. Um, overall, I think I've got a side with Bybee. I'm uh, more attracted to the 7200 price tag. I'm less attracted to the 45% ownership, but, you know, we only got six pitchers, and we got to kind of eat somebody here. So um, it's fine going after the White Sox because, for the most part, a pretty unimpressive offense that's still going to hit a lot of ground balls. And no matter what, if the batted ball match, or no matter that the batted ball matchup is okay and it favors ground ball hitters a little bit, for DFS purposes, you still got to hit the baseball up and out um, and and create line drive type of contact. Bybee's not necessarily going to give that up at too high a clip here. So I uh, got to side with him, um, even though you know you can certainly stack against a 45% on pitcher, like by all means. Dylan Cease going for the Sox. Um, now, he's really the only one left for them because I don't know if everybody has seen it. The Sox traded Lucas Giolito to the Angels last night. Um late last night, after all the games were over, for uh, let's a couple of prospects. It was Giolito and Ronaldo Lopez going over to L.A. I think that's a really, really good pickup for them. We'll talk about him more when he makes his debut for them. But Dylan Cease is the only one left for the White Sox on the mound. Um, they do have you know, what uh, sunshine that they're going to get back, Mike Clevenger, sometime soon, probably in a couple of days. But he's really it. Uh, Dylan Cease at 8000 similar to all of the other guys we've talked about from a price perspective. We're also getting a, a pretty decent discount here. Uh, not necessarily as much as we are with Bybee or with JoJo Gray, for example. Um, but he's seeing a sort of similar price discount that uh, Kodai Senga is seeing, right? Cease has been mid-8Ks or so for the most part part of this season because he's been walking so many damn people he's gotten it a little bit more under control recently and that's nice to see um from dylan cease because the the four and five walk outings are just uh garbage you can't cannot do that um his problem is it's the walks to righties it's not necessarily to lefties it's because the mechanics are bad and the motion is is pretty off to say the least i don't want to go too into that i've talked about it a little bit before um nevertheless his last last start certainly was 
pretty equitable. Um, and we know that Cease has that in the tank, but that was against Minnesota. Start before that, he was serviceable against Atlanta, as a matter of fact. Five innings, six Ks there, just one run allowed, but got picked apart by St. Louis. Didn't walk anybody, struck out eight, but gave up five runs and 11 hits in six innings. And he got picked apart by Oakland, too. Five Ks in five and a third with three earned runs. Um, you know, before that, he had some pretty good outings, a little bit of a stretch there. So it's in the tank, certainly, for Dylan Cease. I do like him a little bit at this price tag. Uh, in this matchup, for strikeouts, it's certainly you know one of the worst in baseball. Um, and it's, it, as a matter of fact, it's not the worst on even just a three-game slate since we've got Washington going, too. But it's pretty similar there. Cleveland actually does create against right-handed pitching, 95 WRC+. Plus. 18.5% strikeout rate. They're not going to hit for any hard contact or power similar to Washington, but they will make um, you know, a good bit of consistent contact, and they will steal some bases. They do have a couple of guys, notably a Jose Ramirez and Josh Naylor, that can hit the baseball over the wall. Not so much with Stephen Kwan, Andre Jimenez, Josh Bell maybe a little bit, but everybody else, I mean, Bo Naylor, yeah, he's got some pop from behind the plate. Um, as the other Naylor brother, sure, they've got a little bit more pop certainly than than does Washington. Now you're if, if we're gonna choose here, I'd probably have to. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really close between playing Cleveland or Washington. Um, I'd probably have to just side with Cleveland. They're just a better offense, and Kodai Senga I think is a little bit better than Dylan Cease, uh, despite the fact that Dylan Cease isn't going to walk as many guys. Um, I think that he will struggle a little bit more with Cleveland than Kodaisenga would with Washington because Cleveland's just got some better hitters, right? And they're more patient hitters uh, than Washington. They will walk more at about 2% more, and that's a big number for a full-team aggregate. That said, most everything here in the arsenal for Cease is, is break-even. It doesn't have any um, you know, outsized, really aggressive pitch. That induces a stupid amount of swing and miss to both sides. If anything, it would be the slider, but for the most part, it's just a break-even pitch. It does have 32% strikeouts against the right side, of course. Um, but unlucky for him, Cleveland is going to platoon pretty damn heavily here. They might have, at most, two right-handers in the lineup tonight. So the numbers against lefties, if we're going to go after Cease, it's with left-handers. Doesn't have you know a change-up. He's still just throwing slider curveball to them to induce the 24% swing and miss there. Um, and he is a fly baller, right? 080 ground ball to fly ball. These guys from the left side of the plate are still going to hit some ground balls. You know, notably like an Andres Jimenez, uh, even Jose Ramirez is going to you know hit some balls. You know, on the ground a little bit. For the most part, this season, he's an 075 ground ball to fly ball guy, uh, and he hit two jacks yesterday at Stola Base. Probably heating up at the plate, and you might want to jump on board with Josie whenever that happens. Um, but from a batted ball perspective this season, not necessarily the best spot, uh, but he still hits uh, you know, 325 with a 390 Woba and a 215 ISO against right-handed pitching. Uh, this is still Jose Ramirez, so you can play him, even though he's at his normal price tag and what I would consider you know, a below-average matchup against Dylan Cease. You can still play him at 5,800. I think my favorite here is probably got to be an Andres Jimenez, uh, perhaps a a Will Brennan in the outfield, uh, something like that. You know, ground ball hitting guys from the left side of the plate. Uh, Josh Naylor is about a neutral ground ball to fly ball. He's unfortunately got a $1,000 price bump himself at up to 5000 so overall, kind of lukewarm on Cleveland here. I think Cease can survive, and this is why I think both sides are in play here as well. So for the most part, um, well, it's kind of just uh, a cop-out here, but play whoever the hell you want, and, uh, and I think for the most part it's pretty okay no matter who you land on. Stephen Kwan, um, probably going to leave it on the table a little bit for me there at 4600 kind of an aggressive price tag for him and I don't necessarily like the upside for him in this spot uh it's just contact so that's fine if you want to play him in stacks or whatever um I would side with Cleveland as opposed to Washington and I think they're they're certainly in play they're not going to be as popular as the Mets St. Louis or the Cubs for example 
I mean, if you want to get really contrarian, you know, play Cleveland or play uh, Washington and play the White Sox because nobody's going to be playing the White Sox, um, you know, relative to the other team. So that's fine. If you want to go after some Bybee, sure. He's 50% owned and nobody's playing the White Sox. So go ahead. Um, but that's kind of my breakdown so far and how I think I'm going to approach it today. Um, and, you know, I'd like to get to, you know, if I were building a ton of teams, I probably won't today, probably just build one team. Not sure where I'm going to go with it yet. Um, but if I were building a ton of teams, I'd have exposure to pretty much all sides of this game. Maybe take some stands in the Cubs and Cardinals game with like Xing a Michaelis and getting some JoJo, something like that. Um, but you know, for the most part in this game, yeah, if we're playing a lot of teams or even five teams, ten teams, whatever, three max even, I think it's an okay idea to have exposure to both sides here. Uh, so that's it. We don't really need to go over a review, right, because we spent 15 minutes on each game here. Um, once again, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates. We will be pushing them uh, throughout the day. They're going to be pretty sparing, of course, because not a hell of a lot is going to change here. Um but keep an eye out for them. We will still be pushing them. And uh, that's it for this short three gamer. Good luck to everybody here on this Thursday. We'll be back tomorrow for a big Friday slate. Good luck.